Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, this is Portrait of the Artist as a Young VXer. This painting is an MBR boot kit. Uh, so, quick disclaimer. The views expressed in this presentation are my own and do not reflect the opinions of my past, present, or future employers. Viewer discretion is advised. Uh, quick, who am I? I'm a security consultant at Leviathan Security Group. I'm also a reverse engineer and artist, and in my personal projects, I like combining those two things. So this is one example of one of those projects. Um, greets to all of the following for their assistance and support with this talk. I wouldn't be here without them. Uh, thanks to the team at Leviathan and to Recon for having me. So the focus of this talk, uh, this is a project focused on creative applications of VX and malware reverse engineering. Um, I'm gonna be talking about how I reverse engineered 16-bit boot kits targeting systems uh, specifically with a legacy BIOS boot process um, and focused on those boot kits of the 80s and 90s. Uh, I'm gonna provide a quick overview of the legacy boot process and I'm gonna be talking about several prominent boot kits of that era. Uh, this talk aims to answer questions including how would you write a boot kit that exists as a work of art and or how would you use VX techniques to create new art? Uh, the next question that sort of implicitly arises from this is why would you do such a thing? And this talk aims to answer that question. Um, on this slide, we have a, we have a video, which, there we go. Uh, this is Marsland by Spanska. So this is a quick shout out to Spanska whose viruses were the reason, or one of the reasons I was inspired to work on this project and continue on this project. Uh, so you can see there, uh, there's the text that says, coding a virus can be creative, which is an adage that I have returned to again and again. So some motivations for this project. Uh, initially, it was to test the claim that malware of the 1980s and 1990s was simple or easy or unsophisticated or just about drawing pretty pictures. Um, this is conclusively false um, and I have a different talk that covers this in more detail so you can check that out there. But this talk specifically is uh, a little more focused on studying the techniques of those reverse samples and studying the techniques of VX Legends um, to create new malware art and using unique properties of VX um, to extend the medium. So really want to live up to the adage that Spanska had in that Marsland piece, which is coding a virus can be creative. Um, and on this slide you see, uh, this is a scan of a print of a painting by Paul de la Roche, which is the young murder. And on this, uh, this is the first 16-bit uh, painting that I made. So. Um, we have the evolution from the young martyr to the young martyr. Uh, those are some of my artistic motivations and inspirations for this work, so you can check them out if you're interested in this kind of creative application of VX and malware. Uh, so we're gonna start with a few definitions. Uh, that's a very, there we go. <laughs> that's uh, a very long definition of a virus uh, by Fred Cohen, but quite simply a virus is a self replicating program that uses a host file to create those new copies of itself. Um, VX uh, stands for virus exchange, so it's uh, formally a collection of malware samples or a repository, but the term VX uh, in the 1980s and 90s and still today uh, is used by those communities that uh, grew around those sites. And a VXer refers to someone who writes viruses, but uh, the term VXer is typically reserved for someone who is truly a lead virus writer. So um, Spanska, Dark Angel, Vecna, uh, those are some individuals who I would consider VXers of this particular era, but there are many others. Uh, polymorphic virus, a uh, virus that uses variable encryption, decryption, and a variable key to create encrypted copies of itself in memory, uh, and those are appended to a host file. Uh, the whole key with using polymorphism in virus writing and malware is to decrease the uh, or increase the variability between different copies of a virus 
and uh, increase the likelihood that your virus will avoid AV detection. Polymorphism uh, as a whole means many forms, so it refers to a program that is self-modifying. Um, in this case, polymorphism can apply to uh, lots of different ways that a virus will alter copies of itself. So I'll talk a little bit about how I use those polymorphic techniques uh, in my new work. Um, a boot kit, a boot kit's a type of malware that infects a critical component of the OS boot process to install itself and maintain persistence. Contrast it with a root kit, uh, which typically targets a very specific OS and a very specific OS version. Uh, a boot kit has a bit more of an agno OS agnostic vector for uh, attacking and uh, maintaining persistence on a target. Now, the last definition here, uh, it's a little bit splitting hairs, but it's important to make the distinction. A boot sector infector is the earliest form of earliest form of a boot kit, and it targets storage media that only had a boot sector. So it didn't target storage media that used an MBR, um, so only focused on infecting uh, systems that use floppy diskettes. Uh, really quickly, I'm just gonna blast through some of these slides, but notable interrupts for uh, DOS malware uh, are on that slide, but we're focused on boot kits, and so legacy BIOS boot kits don't have OS-specific interrupts available to hook, um, so they only are able to use the ROM BIOS interrupts. So when we're looking at legacy BIOS boot kits, uh, those are a few of the ROM BIOS uh, interrupts that are available, but very frequently, uh, all the boot kits that we're gonna be looking at are going to be using in 13, which targets disk services. Uh, this is just a quick diagram of how normally uh, system calls are invoked on DOS. Um, so that's there. And then uh, a terminate and stay resident program is uh, a feature of DOS that allows a user to install a persistent program in RAM, which bypasses the limitations of DOS being a single task OS. So uh, here's a more detailed diagram of that process. It typically involves hooking a specific interrupt, adding a new interrupt handler, uh, which will Im implement a malicious functionality um, and ideally remain uh, under the radar of AV. Okay. Uh, really quickly, tour of the legacy BIOS boot process. Again, detailed diagram, but just to uh, focus on the key features, the boot process in legacy BIOS goes with BIOS initialization, retrieval of either the MBR or the uh, boot sector of a floppy, checking that the MBR or the boot sector is valid, um, loading the MBR or the first sector of the active partition, more checks, and then uh, loading that sector into a specified area of memory, which is OX7C00. Uh, Master boot record, you all probably know this, but just really quickly, uh, contains the MBR code, the partition table of the four potential uh, partitions, and then an MBR signature. The important thing to note here is that an MBR is limited to the size of one sector. So it's 512 bytes, and the MBR code is limited to one BE in hex, or 446. So if you're writing an MBR normally, you have a pretty limited space, but if you're writing an MBR targeting piece of malware, uh, you have to be really, really slick about it. Okay, so uh, what are the ingredients of a 16-bit legacy BIOS boot kit? Well, you need a malicious implant that targets one of these data structures of the uh, pre-OS boot environment, so the MBR, um, be the partition table or the code um, or other structures like the VBR or the IPL. You need a technique for going memory resident, which is typically done with a TSR. Um, again, installs a malicious interrupt handler. And then um, allocating adequate space. Uh, the typical technique that's done is using the BIOS parameter block to allocate um, a specified number of kilobytes in memory. And then you have a variety of stealth techniques. Uh, so you can have spoofing of calls for interrupts that you're hooking, saving a copy of the original MBR, um, and polymorphism. And then finally, uh, additional features of legacy BIOS boot kits. 
They operate in 16-bit real mode, and they had to target different storage media. So at this time, you could see floppies in a variety of formats, or you could see hard disks. So the most effective uh, boot kits of this era would target as many as possible and have routines for uh, effectively handling those different media. Okay, so now we're going on to our iconic boot kits of the era. So I'm gonna start with Brain. Uh, Brain was the first PC virus. It was written in 1986. It's accurately described as a boot sector infector because it could only target floppy disks. Um, specifically, it could only tar target 360 kilobyte floppies. But it used a lot of really, really great techniques that were used uh, throughout this era of boot kits and then also later modified in um, more recent boot kit, um, more recent boot kit malware. So uh, we have things like saving the original boot sector in a specified hidden area of the disk and then memory residence with an INT13 TSR. Um, and there's a documentary about this virus specifically, if you're interested in learning more. Okay, so stoned. Okay. Um, <coughs> All right, Stoned was a famous boot kit. Uh, it inspired a range of related boot kits in the same virus family uh, of varying levels of sophistication. Um, I have a call out here of Michelangelo being an absolute flop. We'll come back to that. Um, Stoned was really great though because it was able to infect boot sectors of different storage media formats. So it could target hard disks or it could target floppies. Um, it used similar stealth techniques as Brain, so uh, used uh, int 13 TSR, uh, some spoofing techniques on that, and it saved the original MBR in, again, a hidden area of the disk. It also had a famous logic bomb, which displayed the, uh, you can see on the right there, your PC is now stoned, one out of every eight times, based on the value of the uh, PC timer. And then it was moderately non-destructive, moderately not malicious. But, uh, these are just some of the uh, features I wanted to highlight uh, as I was reversing it. So Stoned, uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, stores the part of its code that performs the replication in the int13 handler. So the int13 handler is the viral part of Stoned. Um, it handles the infection and the check infection routines. Um, and the int13 handler only triggers on a few specific conditions, so reads or writes, and when the disk motor's off. Um, and again, as I mentioned, uh, the BIOS parameter block was a very common target as a data structure for allocating space uh, for a bootkit, so Stone uses this technique as well. Um, and this is just a bit more detail on how it goes about doing that. All right, so before I get into uh, the next section, I'm just gonna talk briefly about my methodology for reversing 16-bit boot kits. So um, I start with preliminary research, which involves getting a lot of books, reading a lot of zines, uh, referring to the peak literature of the time, um, static analysis using a variety of tools, Radare, Cutter, IdaFree, which had 16-bit support, um, and then reading the source files, which were using assemblers in uh, range. Uh, so we have MASM, TASM, FASM, A86, uh, you name it. So reading the source files and then modifying them uh, to work with a different assembler, which is uh, NASM, which is my assembler of choice. And then dynamic analysis, I did mostly with uh, Kimu and FreeDOS and then Box. Um, DOSBox is fine for looking at uh, the graphical routines, but it's not as helpful for looking at malicious functionality in dynamic analysis. Uh, a bit more detail on that. Uh, the, uh, the R2 plugin that I wrote was essentially uh, an RE side quest. So the goal was to recreate the functionality of IDA free 5.0 in R2. Uh, so on the left you see the annotations of the interrupts in the disassembly, and then on the right, 
the uh, Rodari plugin that I wrote, which um, also automatically annotates the interrupts in the disassembly. Um, one of my other techniques that I used for reversing was using more recent boot kits as a frame of reference. So the Stone boot kit, which was rewritten uh, by Peter Kleisner and presented at Black Hat 2012, includes uh, the entire MBR of the original Stone boot kit. Uh, so I use that for analysis as well. And then finally, uh, we have rewriting my own viruses or boot kits. Um, which was more productive in terms of uh, how I was spending my time rather than uh, trying to modify all of the syntax of an original file. Uh, and it was also a better learning tool because what I wanted to do was write my own and use them to generate art. So um, this is another sample of a um, polymorphic virus I wrote. Um, okay, so. Now we're up to Michelangelo. So Michelangelo was a spooky ripoff of Stoned. Uh, it caused a massive panic. It was featured in a lot of news broadcasts and media uh, because of the, the functionality of the logic bomb. So while Michelangelo was almost identical to Stoned, uh, the thing that it did in changing the logic bomb was um, on Michelangelo's birthday, so March 6th, it would uh, overwrite the disk and uh, just fill it with garbage. So it was more malicious, more destructive, um, and there were aspects of it that I think were improvements on Stoned, but this logic bomb um, and the fact that it uses Michelangelo's name, um, I was disappointed by it. Um, I thought Michelangelo deserved a better boot kit, so I wanted to write one. But in terms of features that were improvements, uh, it improves the code structure and the flow, uh, removes redundant code, and it simplifies certain functions. And it also has a smaller total size, which again is really key when we're talking about MBRs. Uh, those are just some of the resources I used while reverse engineering Michelangelo. And uh, I put reverse engineering in quotes here because the process was a lot of reading the assembly files and then using that knowledge to write my own. So um, again, based on the preliminary research I did, this was a bit faster. So um, this is the overview of the features that I wanted to implement in my new Michelangelo boot kit. So uh, I wanted to combine the best techniques of Stoned and Michelangelo to write a better one. Um, I wanted to use the techniques of writers like Spanska to uh, create sprites, animation, and uh, really encapsulate this concept of VX writing as art. And then use techniques of other VX writers um, who are very prominent of the era for flair. And flair here means polymorphism. Uh, challenges of bootkit art, this is a very uh, long and verbose slide. Uh, but the TLDR here is I wanted a sprite that was large enough to show the details of the original image that I was feeding in, um, but it was still small enough to fit in the free regions of sectors on a disk. Um, eventually, I decided on uh, 128 by 80 as the sprite size, so that's what it ended up being. Okay, so uh, more details on the functionality. Uh, so. We need an int 13 handler, again, because it's disk reads and writes, disk operations. It's targeting that critical component of the boot process. Um, I adapted it from a different demo TSR that I wrote. Uh, I wanted to use polymorphism for both the graphics routines and then for some simple encryption decryption. Um, I thought polymorphism would be an interesting way to modify the resultant images. Uh, so that's what you're going to see in a sec. Um, it replaces the original MBR uh, with the VX MBR, and then it saves the original on free sectors on disk. Um, so the side note here is I've only tested this on an emulator setup. I don't have um, real hardware. So if anyone here has uh, an old machine that's sitting in your basement and isn't used and you would like to 
test and need free samples, please let me know. Um, there's a graphical payload, of course, because it's Michelangelo. We have to uh, really live up to his artistic legacy. And then it stores the graphical payload on sectors on the disk that are free um, based on how FDisk worked and uh, the fact that there was a, free re a range of free sectors between the MBR and the first sector of the active partition uh, that you could use for whatever you like. So uh, in this instance, it was roughly 62, 61, um, depending on how I created the image in Kimu. Okay, uh, these are just some uh, details on how I created the sprite. Uh, so on the left uh, is the original image of a drawing I did, which is um, a drawing of a sculpture of Michelangelo. So Michelangelo did a sculpture called the Pieta, uh, which is uh, Mary and Jesus. Uh, I did a bunch of sketches of this, I scanned them, and then I used a Python script to downsample them and create this pixelated image on the right. Um, also use the Python script to change the bitmap into bytes, which I would just append to the code. Um, and then uh, we have, at the end, the sprite generation. Um, we're now displaying the sprite with some VGA magic. So using everyone's favorite VGA mode 13, which is 256 by 320 by 200. So all the colors. Um, okay, so here's the, here's the demo that I have. Um, full disclaimer, the full demo with the bootkit functionality and the polymorphic art generation is not working. Um, I think it's the N13 TSR. Um, I was up until three debugging in Kimio, so I'll add it to the repo as soon as it's up. Um, but for right now, this is uh, an example of the polymorphism uh, with the graphical payload, so. All right, it runs for a while, so. <laughs> um, and on this slide, um, I've just included the resultant images of uh, after four runs of it, so you can see after each generation, uh, it's different, and that's because of the polymorphic routines um, in the payload where it's um, altering the image that's displayed by doing different manipulations with the bytes, so it's adds and shifts and um, ors and what have you. So you can see um, the part that's the same that is uh, my, that was my confirmation check that it was uh, essentially a part of it was stagnant for each run is the signature in the top left and then the images are all different. So. And I'm just gonna conclude with some connections to modern boot kits. Um, so DOS, of course, is dead, um, RIP, but systems that use legacy BIOS are not. Um, are you techniques for working with or reversing 16-bit um, boot kits are equally applicable to 16-bit boot kits of different OSs, again, because of the more OS agnostic nature of the MBR and the legacy BIOS boot process. Um, these techniques are also applicable if you're looking at RE or exploit writing for the BIOS specifically. Uh, so there's some resources there, um, some FRAC articles and a really good book um, about BIOS disassembly and exploit writing. And then uh, some other interesting applications I found were VGA targeting malware, so that's a really good presentation uh, from 2012. And finally, the connection to UEFI. Um, obviously, it's not one-to-one. -one. Um, and UEFI, um, as I'm sure we all know, replaced legacy BIOS and offers significant security advantages, but it's not perfect. So knowing where to look in legacy BIOS boot kits, uh, knowing how VX writers targeted different vulnerable areas, different data structures, um, and were able to identify which part of the early OS process they wanted to target, 
is equally applicable when you're writing UEFI exploits. Um, I found that this research has been really instrumental in making my uh, UEFI targeting work uh, so much better. So. Um, and those are just some of the sources for where I got the viruses that I was looking at. And, and we have some references. So. And that's it. So does anyone have any questions? Hello, hello, okay. As the frames were progressing, was the color changing in the background and also polymorphism, or is that something else going on? No, it was the same, yeah. Cool. You said that you hadn't had a chance to run this on real hardware yet. What kind of system do you need to test something like this? Uh, so my current setup is um, I have a bunch of different VMs, and then I'm using uh, emulators within those VMs. I guess you could uh, do it equivalently natively, but uh, Kimu um, for just creating the disk images. Um, I have a script that will automatically write uh, the payloads to the disk images if I don't feel like running them within the disk images and mounting and transferring over and everything. Um, and then box for debugging. Um, because the debugger on box, box is, um, I found, most useful for this, um, especially, especially for uh, bootkit testing. Okay, thanks so much, everyone.